Turn over with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 27. Uh, let's start, let's just start here. Genesis 1, 27. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God created us in his very likeness. You know, when you, when you read Genesis chapter 1, you see that God, you know, he created the heavens and the earth, and then he created the, the trees and the plants and the, the, the produce uh, the seed, and he created the animals and all these things. But none did he create in his image until he came to mankind, and he created mankind in his image. Father, I thank you that we are created in your image. In the image of you, my Father, you created us. I thank you, Father, that that very nature, your created nature, dwells on the inside of us. And I thank you, Lord, that we're able to walk out your good blessing and, and plan for our lives because of the Holy Spirit. Not only did you create us in your image, but you gave us your spirit. And we thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, here over the last few weeks, we, we did uh, uh, some lessons on Jesus is watching, right? There's nothing we can do that God doesn't know about. You know, you're not getting away with anything. You know, people sometimes think, well, you know, I'm, I got away with it. Well, no, you may, you may have got away with it behind my back, got away with it behind your back, but God knows about it. And whatever you sow in life, you will also reap. So, though it seems like you got away with it. You know, I, how many times have I heard stories of, of people who, who did something wrong to us in business. And then you hear about some problem they had in life. You know, I, I don't believe in coincidences. You know, we, I had a, a client one time, this was many years ago, back when we owned our computer stores, and he had bought whatever, some kind of computer system with several thousand, thousand dollars, and for whatever reason, when he came in to pick it up, he was short an amount equal to about the sales tax, which in Washington is, I don't know, 10%, whatever, well, it's high. They get lots of, lots of liberal things to fund up there, you know, so, uh, but whatever it was, you know, and he had it, he said, you needed this thing, he had to have it, and he said, look, I always pay my bill. You know, when somebody starts patting you on the back, telling you how good they are and all this, I've learned over the years, just watch out, you know, I mean, you know, people's character will be proved by their actions, not by their words, but this guy, boy, I always pay my bills, I've never stiffed anybody, I've never, well, come 30 days, no payment, and can't get hold of them. Come 60 days, we still haven't been able to get hold of them, no payment. And now there's, it was probably about three months, we finally got somebody to pick up the phone, and it was his daughter. And during this time period when he had not paid us, he had come down with something, I don't know whether it was related to diabetes or whatever, and he had to go through an amputation and all this other stuff. And I'm thinking... You know, I, Oral, I remember Oral Roberts' story that when he was in the hospital dealing with his heart condition, God spoke to him and said, I gave you the message of seed faith. And Oral said, yeah, I'm going to sow my way out of this. I'm going to trust God. And, and he said he sowed, and, and immediately the manifestation began to come in his life. That's how it came in his life. I'm not saying that's how it's going to come in yours, but it's how it came in his life. And, but what was sown... On this one day, and what was reaped on this other day. You know, we, we know that Jesus is watching. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus did it, but what I'm saying is, is God can't keep his hand of protection on people who aren't obedient. We see it in King Saul's life, and I don't want to go into the whole story of, of David, but Saul lost his kingdom. Why? Because he moved himself outside of the protection of God. Through disobedience. 
So we talked about Jesus is watching, and then we spent several weeks on, on he must increase. How the, the bigger we make God in our life and the, and the less emphasis we put on our life, the more God is able to empower us and utilize us in life. And he gets the glory for it. At the end of the day, he gets the glory for it. So I labeled this. Scotty came and asked me, he said, what's the name of this lesson? And I said, like God. Well, that sounds really good. Like God. Everybody should like God. But no, be like God. Like God. Why would God choose you? You ever think about that? Why would God choose you? Go over with me to Psalms chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Why would God choose me? There's got to be some reason why God chose me. In Psalms 2, 8 and 9, it says, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Everything God had, everything God has, and everything God will have has been given to you. He's given it all to you. But see, as, as, as Christians growing up, I don't know about you, but me, as Christians growing up, I was taught about what I didn't have. What I wasn't entitled to. You know, how it was important to be humble and poor. You know, that kind of thing. But man, then God shined the light of revelation. And I realized I didn't have to be poor anymore. I didn't have to be poor uh, physically. I didn't have to be poor spiritually. I didn't have to be poor mentally. Why? Because God has given us everything that he's had, that he has, and that he's going to have. Because he loves you. Because he loves me. The earth and all of the nations were created for us. It was all created for us. And yet, you know, sometimes, you know, we get a little rental house, you know, when we're young, and we think, oh, man, isn't this great? But the nations were created for us. And our minds, though, are not in a position to receive it. God gave us and created in us the ability to reform the resources for benefits. He gave us that creative nature to transform the things of this natural world into the things that we see. You know, this tablet is the transformation of the resources that God put in the world. Well, how could we do that? We'll do it because God put them all at our fingertips. And many times I believe that the reason why Christians are living below uh, the secular world is because God has told them to do things and to create things and to, to take hold of things, but they have been disobedient, whether it's through religious blindness, not believing that they were capable or entitled to or uh, able to possess it, that God eventually says, man, I need to get this thing in the earth because of, of, of my plan for man. And, and now the wealth becomes the world's and yet that wealth was saved up for you as the righteous for me as the righteousness of God go over with me now to Colossians 1 16 Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 in Colossians 1 16 it says for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth that pretty much covers everything he created it all all the things that are visible and all the things that are invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and all things were created for him. You know, you might look at that and say, well, God's a selfish God. Well, he, he is in, in the instance that he is not going to share his glory with anyone. But he created all these things for himself. Well, what was one of the things that God created? Us. Genesis 1.27. And he created us in his image. It's the only thing that we see that God created that is in his image. Us. Mankind. All things or everything was created to bring him pleasure. 
That was, his, that was his desire, was to bring him pleasure. And it doesn't matter whether you can see them or not. See, because the spiritual realm, just because we can't see it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It was created for him and for his pleasure. This natural realm, created for him and created for his pleasure. And it doesn't matter how big or how small. See, our minds are what put limitations on things. Well, you know, you're a Christian, so you shouldn't make over 40000 a year because, you know, if you make more than that, you'll be tempted by money, and everybody knows that money is the root of all evil. You, know, you heard it. I mean, you heard it. Boy, that pastor down at that other church, you know, he, he's greedy. He's driving a Cadillac, and that's unrighteous, and he should sell that thing and give the money to the poor. You know, they tried that same trick on Jesus. You know, when she brought the costly oil, perfume, and poured it upon him, and they said, man, couldn't that have been sold and given to the poor? And Jesus said, leave her alone. My father created all these things, and they're made for my pleasure. She's done a good thing in preparation for my burial. Leave her alone. See, one looks at scarcity. The other looks at abundance. See, God created abundance, but religion has taught us to look at scarcity. You know, keep our pastors poor and broke, and then we can keep them under control. The church did that for years with congregations. Keep the people ignorant, keep them poor, keep them broke, and tell them that's the way God wants them, and we can keep them under control. But that does not bring God pleasure. God created the abundance of this, of this world for us us to enjoy. God chose us to be his vessel of enjoyment of all things. Isn't that awesome? God chose us. You know, he doesn't show up here on Sunday in his, you know, with his feet of brass and his eyes of fire and a sword coming out of his mouth. You know, he doesn't come here and, and physically sit on the front row. No, he sits all over this congregation, living and dwelling on the inside of us and taking pleasure when all of us experience the fullness of all that he created. He receives his pleasure through his creation through us. So we should never be embarrassed. We should never uh, think, well, what if somebody sees me? You know, what if somebody sees me doing this or doing that? Well, if you're doing what, what God has blessed you with to do, then enjoy it. For he created all things for his pleasure, and it brings him pleasure when you're having pleasure. What he's looking for is obedience. When we separate ourselves from greed and lust and are out doing things in obedience, he brings great pleasure into our life. And during the midst of our pleasure and opportunity, we get the ability to share the gospel and be ministers of reconciliation. Amen? Mankind was the only vessel or being ever created in the God class. Do you realize that we are created in the same class as God? We have the ability to create eternal life. When a husband and wife come together and the two become one flesh and they produce children, they are creating eternal beings created in the image of God. We are in the same class as God, as created beings. We are not in the angelic class. Angels were created in order to be ministering spirits. What does that mean? They were made to come and help us get the job done. So that's why I send them out to do work. I think some of, some of our some believers, angels, they're getting fat and lazy. They got nothing to do. They're just sitting there waiting for something to do, and nobody's, nobody's putting them to work. So they're just sitting around. They're ministering spirits. They're in an angelic class. But you are created in a God class, in the likeness, in the image of God, in his image. That word image in, in Genesis 1 27, Salem, means like the similitude, the resemblance. It's the same word that is used for statue, an exact replica of God. I mean, Adam and Eve were designed to have no lack. 
I, our Father, has no lack. God has no lack. You are designed to not have lack. The only thing that brings lack into our life is sin. And when we are sin conscious, we allow that to have a work on our life, and it brings in uh, confusion, which is the opposite of peace. It brings in fear, which is the opposite of love. That's, that's the carnal or sin nature, nature of life. And that's why we're not supposed to operate in the natural realm. We're not supposed to, to walk by sight. We're supposed to walk by faith, like God walks. Why? Because we're created in His resemblance. We're created in His similitude. We are created to be godlike. We're created to be creative creatures. We have got power in our words. I mean, Pastor Thor said it a, little, a minute ago when taking up the offering, death and life are in the power of the tongue. We have creative force even in our words that we speak. See, God thinks towards you like he thinks towards himself. He doesn't think towards you one way and then think towards himself another. God only thinks about blessing. That's why when you get to heaven, there won't be any sickness. And that's why God can't put sickness on anybody. He doesn't have any. He doesn't think about it. It's not his issue. His issue is life and life more abundantly. Over with me to Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. Many of you guys know this scripture by heart. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. See, God knows, and we should know what God knows. I mean, that's what our pursuit should be as believers, is to find out what God knows. When you find out what God knows, now you become useful. Well, God knows there is no lack. Why? Because he doesn't believe in lack. And when you get on the same page with God, you can overcome lack. Do you know in every nation that I've been in around the world and, and that I've you know, studied and seen, every nation where there's abject poverty and horrible things happen, there are rich people. There's people of abundance. See, somebody got the mindset that they didn't have to live in poverty, that they didn't have to live in lack. See, God didn't create us to live that way. He created us to live in abundance. But sin wants to tell us to live below where God created us. But when we understand who we are in Christ, what God created us to be, and what it means to be like God and to live the thoughts that He lives towards us, we can live above and not beneath in every area of our life. God is a faith God because He is. God is love. He's a faith God. But faith worketh by love, right? You know, 1 John 4, 8, we talked about this on Sunday. God is love. Let me read real quickly here, Galatians 5, 6 from the Amplified. It says, For if we are in Christ Jesus doesn't matter whether we're circumcised or uncircumcised. It doesn't count for anything. But it's faith activated and energized and expressed working through love. Now, see, we were created like God. So we were created to be creatures of love. And because we're creatures of love, we dominate by faith. Our faith is a love action. What did God do when he had, he had faith? He expressed his love with it. Right? He created the universe. He, he set up the ability for there to be no lack. When God created the heaven and the earth, he did not set up a lack system. He set up a, a system of prosperity that was to be fruitful and just to multiply. Not just to add to, but to multiply. That was the system that God set up. Why? Because he's a God of love. Love produces. Love produces in life. In Genesis 1.27, it says that we're in his image. So we are, are, are made to be producers of love, and it activates our faith. 
So people say, boy, I'd like, I want to have more faith. Well, go to 1 Corinthians 13 and start loving more like that. And your faith will be more empowered. Because that's the way God created the system. Remember, we got to get to know, uh, if we know things that God knows, if we, if we know things the way God knows things, our life will be empowered, our life will be energized. Romans 8.10 says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That comes from Deuteronomy 30.14. The word is near us. Well, what word? God's word. What's so important about God's word? It is life. Adam and Eve, that's what they had to live on in the Garden of Eden, was God's word. He created Adam, set him in the garden. Mankind was set in the garden and told to be fruitful. And God saw that there was no one, uh, you know, amenable to him, no one like him, no one compatible to him. So God took Adam and made Ish and Isha. He, he created two beings, male and female, and told the two to come together and said, Hey, look, this is my word. Be fruitful and multiply. Tend this garden. Take care of it. Just don't eat from the tree of good and evil. He said, and it'll be well with you. That's my word. It'll be well with you. And everything was good when they operated in obedience with God's word. And that's the way it is for us. The more the deeper we get God's word on the inside of us, the, the more we should be walking in love, the more our faith should operate. Why? Because that's how God is. That's who God is. It's even in our heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. See, God's word comes into our life and then we share it, preach, proclaim, declare it. How do we do that? Well, we do it in many different ways. I mean, it doesn't take somebody here on Thursday night or Sunday morning getting up and teaching the word, but it happens at work. I remember when I was working for the Department of Corrections in, in running the information technology stuff up in Washington. And, you know, I never went in with a big King James Bible, you know, and at the staff meeting, slammed on the table and said, okay, you're my staff, this is my Bible, if you have Bible questions, come to me. No, I didn't do any of that. I just lived differently. I just talked differently. I made myself available and interested. You know, I'm not really interested in your kid's second birthday, but I'm interested in you. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? You have to be interested in people if you care about people. But you know what ended up happening? Many times people would come into my office and shut the door and say, well, I know we're at work, but can I just ask you some questions? Why? Because the word was on the inside of me. What was in me was coming out of me. So it can happen at work. It can happen in a grocery store. It can happen any place where you have an opportunity to, to share the gospel, to share the good news, to share the truth of God, the kingdom of God. You see somebody hurting and say, well, my Jesus heals. Can I pray for you? Well, would you do that? Oh, really? Yeah, please pray for me. We have the opportunity. Why? Because that word that we preach is the word that came from God. It's His word. It's His word. John 1 says that that word is salvation. That word is salvation. It's meant to be nothing missing or nothing broken. Completeness, the Zoe kind of life. In 1 John 4, 8, it says that that word is love. In Mark eleven twenty two, we're told that it's the God kind of faith. And see, we can have that kind of faith. Isn't that awesome what Jesus said? He says, have the God kind of faith. 
Well, he wouldn't have told us to have something if we couldn't have it. Why can we have the God kind of faith? Because you were created in the image of God. You were designed and created on a whole different level. You were designed to be like God. That's how come we can have his faith. We get it in, in a measure, for God has given to every man the measure of faith, but it's God's faith. And we see from what Jesus told us is that faith can accomplish anything. He explained that that's how he could curse a fig tree and it can die. And he says, this faith will move mountains for you. Why? Because it's God's faith. It's the same faith that God used to create everything that exists. I mean, he created the, if he can use that faith to create the earth, we can use that faith to, to move mountains in our life. You know, when you think about this word, in 1 John 14, it says this word became flesh. It became Christ. It became Christos. It became Mashiach. It became the anointing of God. This word became flesh, and, and, and Jesus walked in this earth with this word. And what was he doing? He was going about doing good and healing all yeah, but what he, was he doing? He was conveying the good news or the message of God. He says, oh, if the Father speaks to me, I speak to you. I just tell it to you. He said, these words are life. Yeah, they're life to all that find them. They're life. They're powerful. And the writer of Hebrews says that they are sharper than any two-edged sword. This word that we preach, this word that we speak is the word of God. And that's why it's so important to have the word of God on the inside of you. Because if you don't have it on the inside of you, it won't come out of, the, out of you. It won't come to the outside of you. It won't manifest. Somebody needs, needs help in the area of healing. And you won't know that the Bible says that I am the Lord thy God who healeth all thy disease. You won't know it until you get it in you. This word that we preach is literally the word of God. And that's why when we go to Romans from 10.8 to 10.9, it says, See, this is the word of God, this word that we preach, that if we confess with our mouth, if we speak the word of God, and we believe it in our heart, the faith that is inside of us, that Jesus is, is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Or as Jesus said to Nicodemus, born again. We transform our lives from being that of the natural to being what God created us to be supernatural in his image. We become like God when we transform into his likeness. Romans 12.2 don't be conformed to this world. You know, don't get stuck in what this world has for us. But be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The mind is where the battlefield is. The mind is what the enemy likes to attack. I mean, when, when, when tribulation and trials come, you know, it's not my elbow that starts with. No, it's my mind. What am I going to do? How am I going to tithe this week? How am I going to? What am I going to do? It's a battlefield of mind, so we need to transform our minds so that when those thoughts hit, they hit the love of God. And what happens is it just gives me joy. Father, you have an opportunity to show yourself strong again. I give you praise. Now, what was that issue? I completely forgot about it because God already took it transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So that we can prove, we can make real the Word of God to His glory. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So faith comes by hearing about God. So if we want to be transformed into his likeness, we need to hear about him. 
We need to understand, how do we hear? Well, fortunately for us, we can hear by reading the Word. We can also take people of faith who have revelations in areas that we don't yet, and we can listen to them and then go back and prove it by the Word. Everything by the Word. Because this Word, this Word is what took on flesh. No other word. In Genesis, God's word took on flesh. From the dust of the ground, he created man with his words. In John 1.1, 1, 1, we see that, that the word that, that became Christ, the anointing, took on flesh when the Holy Spirit and Mary, when, when the Holy Spirit came to Mary and said, Hey, you're going to be with child. The word of God. Where did that word, where, when did God speak that into being? In Genesis chapter 3, when God prophesied in, in cursing the serpent and said to him, I am going to raise up my own seed and it shall bruise your head with his heel. See, God spoke that word. That word then took on flesh. So that word is life transforming. That word is, is faith building. So we need to get that word into the inside of us. In Joshua 1.8, I love this verse. This book of the Torah. See, that's speaking of the first five books of the Bible. God told Joshua, these first five books that I gave to Moses, it shall never leave, it shall never be found outside of, it shall never uh, disappear from your mouth. This word moosh means it'll never cease. This book of the law shall not depart, shall not cease from your mouth. You shall meditate on it, right? Day and night. Now, last time I checked, there's two times. There's day and night. And God is telling Joshua to meditate on it all day long. You should never stop thinking about my word. Today I'm down doing some stuff in Phoenix. And I'm just meditating on the word. I'm meditating on the word. And God is bringing a, a deeper revelation into to an area. Just meditating on the word. We're supposed to be doing that. On a daily basis. You go off on a long trip, meditating on the Word. I mean, you can meditate on the Word many ways. You can put in teaching tapes, meditate on the Word. You can have just quiet, just Holy Spirit speak to me, meditating on the Word. But we're supposed to do that day and night, all the time. You know, in Psalms 119, uh, 162 through 165, I rejoice in your Word as one who finds great spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but your law do I love. Seven times a day and all day long will I praise you because of your righteous decrees. Great peace have they who love thy law. Where does that great peace come from? It comes from meditating. David was saying, I rejoice because I get to, 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 to just to meditate on your word, not only seven times a day, but all day long. And it brings me great peace. Transformed. Peace. So, but you should meditate on it day and night and observe to do according to what's written in it. See, that's another thing. We've got to do according to what's written in it. It doesn't do you any good to meditate on God's Word if you, if you say, okay, well, that's for, that's for church. That's for Sunday and Thursday night. You know, but, but when I leave there, I, I'm leaving that behind because, you know, I've got to get my groove on. I've got to get my thing on. You know, I've got to do my own thing. But if we deserve, observe to do what's written in it, You'll make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. In other words, you'll be more like God. I'll be more like God. My way will be prosperous and I'll have good success. When my way's not prospering and I'm not having good success, I got to look in the mirror and say, okay, which part did I not observe? Which part am I not observing? 
Let's close with this. Go with me to John 14, verses 12 through 14. John 14, 12 through 14. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do greater works than these. Why? Because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. He said, just ask and I'll do it. I, how much better of a covenant is that? Like God, we should be operating in this earth. You are a royal priesthood. I am a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We no longer should be living like, like we, we can't. We need to start living like we can. Because we are like Him. Amen? Father, I thank You that we are created in Your image, just like You. I thank You, Father, that we are the head and not the tail. We are above and not beneath. To Your glory, Father, let our lives exemplify You, that this world will know that there is a God in this earth, that you are the God in this earth, that there is a God in heaven, but he has chose to walk among men. We thank you for that Holy Spirit, that you lead us and guide us each day. Amen.